Hello, my name is Erin Aubrey, and I'm one of the financial aid advisors at Northeast Wisconsin Technical College in Green Bay. Today, we're going to be covering the 2021 to 2022 NASFA financial aid presentation. We're going to talk about what you need to know about financial aid. If you have questions on this presentation, please reach out to your high school counselor or to the financial aid office at the school that you or your student will be attending. So with that said, we'll jump right into the presentation. The topics that we're going to discuss today are what is financial aid, the cost of attendance, the expected family contribution, uh, what financial need means, the different categories, types, and sources of financial aid, the FAFSA, which is that free application for federal student aid, and then we'll also touch on special circumstances and what those are. So financial aid in a very broad sense is everything consisting of the funds provided to students and families to help you pay for those post-secondary educational expenses that you're going to incur by going to college. The cost of attendance then is a number that each college sets um, that includes direct costs like tuition and fees, books and supplies, things like that, that you're going to be paying to that school. And then also indirect expenses like room and board, transportation, miscellaneous personal expenses, um, and you know those other things that you're going to be having to pay for while you are a student. Um, each college sets their own cost of attendance. You can find this number on the financial aid website um, for the college that you're considering. Um, each school is going to be different, so this number is not going to be the same across the board. Um, for instance, the cost of attendance of attending a school like NWTC is going to be vastly different than attending a private school like a St. Norbert um, College, anything along those lines. So when you're starting to kind of look at different colleges and figure out where you want to go, this is definitely a number that you're going to want to look into. Um, the other number then that we in the financial aid office use is what's called your expected family contribution or your EFC. Um, this is the measurement of the students and the family's ability to pay for those post-secondary educational expenses. Um, it does include the student contribution portion, and then it also includes the parent portion as long as the student is dependent. So if that parent information is required for the FAFSA, is going to take the combined contribution from each student and parent, and that's where we're going to get that EFC from. Um, unlike the cost of attendance, this number is going to be the same regardless of what school you go to, um, because it's based on that one FAFSA application that you're going to do. Um, so this will not change. Um, each student does have their own EFC based on their situation. The reason that we need these two numbers is to figure out what a student's financial need is. And how we do that is we take that cost of attendance and we subtract out the expected family contribution, and that's where we get that financial need from. Um, so like cost of attendance, this number is going to be different re depending on which school you're going to go to. So your financial need at NWTC will be different than it would be at UWGB or St. Norbert College um, because that cost of attendance is always going to be changing. Um, the reason that we need to know what a student's financial need is, is to determine what categories and amounts of financial need a student is eligible for. There are different types that are gonna be need-based, um, so not every student will be eligible for those types of aid if they don't have a financial need. Um, and then there's also non-need-based types of aid that would be, um, you know, certain types of loans and things like that, that regardless of the financial need, the student would at least be offered those types. So this kind of breaks it down a little bit farther um, with those four different types of financial aid. There's self-help aid, which are going to be um, the loans and the work study. And then there's also gift aid, which would be the scholarships and grants. Um, scholarships are considered gift aid because they don't have to be paid back. Um, so those are going to be gifted to a student. Um, grants fall in that same category then because anything that you're offered and accepted in a grant is not going to have to be repaid when you're finished with school. The other side of it then with the self-help aid, 
there's work study employment. Those are jobs through the work study program at your college. Um, a lot of the times those are going to be on campus. There are some off campus opportunities with that work study employment. You have to actually work to earn the money. So that's why that's considered self help. Um, and then there's also different types of loans um, that are considered self help because anything that you do borrow in a loan, you are going to have to repay when you either stop attending school, drop below half time, which is less than six credits, or when you graduate. So just know anything that you borrow in a loan, you are going to be responsible for repaying that when you're finished with school. There's a lot of different sources of financial aid. There's the federal government, there's states, colleges and universities, private sources and employers. The federal government is by far the largest source of financial aid. Um, the majority of the financial aid that's provided by the federal government is going to be based on that financial need, which is why students are required to apply for that FAFSA. Um, we need to know what that EFC is so we can know what types of aid and amounts of aid we're able to award. Um, and then there's also other eligibility requirements that are gonna have to be met. The breakdown of those federal student aid programs. The federal Pell Grant is the biggest grant program that they do offer. Um, again, that is based on need though, so not every student will be eligible for that. Um, there's also an Iraq Afghanistan service grant. Um, there's the Federal Supplemental Educational Opportunity Grant, or the FSEOG, um, which is another grant that some students are eligible for based on need. Um, if you are, if your student is considering becoming a teacher, they may want to look into that TEACH grant. Um, that's, that's a great option for students that may not be eligible for other types of grants, um, but that one is based on merit as well. Um, there's that federal work study program then that we touched on, which is that work and earn program. Um, there's federal direct student loans, which includes subsidized as well as unsubsidized loans. Um, those are loans that are going to be borrowed by the student um, and repaid then by the student when they're finished with college. And then there is also federal plus loans, which is a parent loan that the parent could borrow to help with the cost of the school for the student if they aren't eligible for enough in the other sources of aid that, that the student would be borrowing. There are different state programs then. Um, it differs state by state. So um, there's residency requirements that typically apply. So in order to be eligible for like the Wisconsin grant, you do have to be a resident of the state of Wisconsin. Um, you can touch base with your financial aid office of where you're going to see what state programs that they do offer. Um, aid could be provided either on the basis of merit, on the basis of need, or for both. Um, generally, we're going to require that FAFSA to be completed as well. Um, and sometimes there's other applications that the state may require depending on the program. And the deadlines are going to vary state by state. So again, that's something that you're going to want to look into. Colleges and universities then have their own programs that they offer. Um, the aid could be provided, again, either on merit, on need, or both. Um, there may be gift aid, so scholarships. They may have certain grant programs, um, or there could also be self-help aid. So work study is a big one, um, and some colleges may have um, like Perkins loans and things like that that they offer. Um, again, almost all of these are going to require that FAFSA to be completed, so it's important that you do it every year. And then there may also be other applications like scholarship applications and things like that that you have to do. Um, the deadlines are going to vary by institution, so that's something to look into early once you do know where you're going to be going so you don't miss scholarship deadlines and things like that. In some cases, there's also private sources, so if the student's a member of a certain foundation, um, a church, if they're a member of a charitable organization, things like that, they, they may have different grants or scholarships or things that they do award. So that's something to definitely look into if you know your student is a part of anything like that. And then as well as employers, um, sometimes if the, the parent is employed at a certain place or if the student is an employee, um, they may have different scholarships or things that are 
available. Um, same with educational benefits, tuition reimbursement, things like that. So you'd want to check with your um, employer's HR department typically is who would handle that to see if there's any opportunities there. So the FAFSA is the free application for federal student aid. Um, the most important word in that is free. Um, don't ever, ever, ever pay to complete the FAFSA. The FAFSA application is always going to be free. So you want to make sure that you're on that FAFSA.gov. Um, anything related to financial aid is never going to be a .com. So you're going to be .gov, .org, .edu, um, things like that. It's never going to be .com, and you never have to pay to complete that application. If it's asking you for credit card information, if it's asking you for a payment, you're on the wrong website. Um, so just make sure you're always on that FAFSA.gov, and you're never paying anybody to, to do it for you. We, you know, your financial aid office will certainly help you with it, things like that, too. Um, but what this application does is it collects the demographic and financial information about the student, and then if the student is dependent, also the parent. Um, that information is going to be used to calculate that EFC that we need. Um, we use that then to offer that financial aid to students, and the application is available in both English and Spanish. You can file this FAFSA at any point during an academic year. Um, it opens October 1st every year. So if you're going to be in college next year, you're going to be completing that 2021-2022 application um, at any point now. It opened up on October 1st, so it is out there for you to do. Um, and you do have to do this every year. Um, so some colleges may also set different priority dates, so that's something to also check in with um, to see if, you know, there's there's different deadlines for different types of financial aid and things like that. There's a few different ways to complete the FAFSA. Uh, the preferred way, the easiest way to do it is going to be that FAFSA on the web, which is doing it, you know, online at FAFSA.gov. Um, they did also come out with a mobile app a few years ago, um, so you are able to do that. It's the My Student Aid mobile app where you can complete the FAFSA that way. Um, there is a PDF version of it that you can print and fill out and mail in. Um, you can also do it over the phone. Um, and then that last one is that FAA Access, which is the financial aid administrator. So on our side of it, we have access to that application. Um, on our side of it as well. The preferred method, like I said, is to be that FAFSA on the web um, or even that My Student Aid app. The reason for that is there's built-in edits that, that are going to pop up if it can tell that you're entering something incorrect, if you're skipping portions, things like that. It's going to give you an error message and save a lot of time on the back end with trying to fix things. Um, they also have skip logic in there, so not every single person needs to complete every single question on the FAFSA. So if it's not going to apply to or if it's not needed, it's going to automatically skip those questions and save you some time. Um, and then there's also the option to use the IRS data retrieval tool. And what that allows you to do is import your tax data directly into the FAFSA from the IRS. Um, that's nice because it's going to eliminate a lot of errors um, and things like that. It's also the more timely way to do it. Um, they typically get those processes within a couple days of the submission um, versus if you're having to mail in that paper form, things like that, it's going to take a lot longer. There's also detailed instructions and help questions um, throughout it as well. So if you're not sure on what to put, there's little pop-ups that can kind of help you determine what you should be answering for those. You can also check that application status right online so you can see if it processed correctly, if there's anything wrong with it that's preventing it from processing. Um, and then it, it simplifies the process for the following year because it's going to save a lot of your information in there. So you're not going to have to enter your name, your social, your birth date, um, your residency information, all of that's going to be saved in there. And each year, you're basically going to be updating your tax information then. So this is what that website looks like. Um, so again, you want to make sure you're on that FAFSA.gov. Um, once you get onto there, um, you're going to click on that Apply for Aid section, um, and then it's going to, to let you complete the FAFSA form. 
um, the website is down here. So I apologize, I've been saying FAFSA.gov. Um, it's recently updated to be studentaid.gov. Um, if you type in FAFSA.gov, it still will direct you to this site. Um, and then this is just a little screen grab of what you're going to want to be clicking on. So if you're new to the process, you can click on that start here. If you've ever done it before, um, and are returning to make corrections, things like that, you would click on login. There is the option to log in as the student or to log in as the parent. Um, so if, you know, the following year, if your student is away at college and you're not able to actually do it together, um, the student can do their portion and then the parent could sign in from their portion at home. These are just a couple screen grabs in of what it looks like for that My Student Aid mobile app. Um, it's the same process, same questions, everything like that. It's just going to go through it on your phone then instead of doing it on um, online. The information is still protected the same way as it is with that FAFSA on the web. Um, it's going to ask you for the same information, um, that save key that it's going to ask you for. You want to make sure you write that down in case you can't finish the application and have to come back to it at a later time. You're going to have to know your username, your password, and also that save key. Um, same with the FAFSA on the web, you're able to complete or track that completion. So it's going to show you what sections you've completed and what you have left to finish. And then um, at the end, you're going to agree to those terms. It's going to give you that confirmation of submission. And it's also going to show you right away at the end what your expected family contribution is estimated to be. This number could change just depending on, on whether everything that you entered was correct or if you're selected for verification. There could be things that come up that could change that. Um, number, but this is based on what you entered. It does give you that idea about what your EFT is. So touch base on that IRS data retrieval tool a little bit farther. Um, this is that option that you're going to be given if you use FAFSA on the web or that My Student Aid mobile app. Um, this allows for your tax return information to be transferred directly from the IRS database. Um, it's voluntary, so you don't have to to use it, um, it'll give you the option of whether or not you want to. So if you don't want to, you, could, you certainly could skip it. Um, what it's going to do is bring you to the IRS's website and you're going to authenticate your information. Um, if they're able to locate your tax record, it then gives you the choice to transfer all of that into the FAFSA and you're not going to have to enter it in line by line. Um, and then if you are selected for what's called verification, it can reduce the documents that we need from you. Um, we won't need to request copies of your taxes and things like that because we know that all the information entered is correct because it's coming in straight from the IRS. Not every single student and parent are going to be given the option to use it. Um, if you did not file taxes, you're not going to be given the option because there's obviously no tax return to link it to. If your marriage date is January 2020 or later, um, so if you recently got married, if you recently got divorced, things like that, your in your marital status doesn't match your tax status, it won't let you do it because it, it can't separate out income and it can't pull in two different tax returns. So if you know mom and stepdad recently got married, it can't find both and pull that in. Um, so that's another reason why. If the first three digits of your social are 666, it won't. Um, if the tax return filed was not a US one, um, if you're married and filed as head of household or if you filed separate returns, um, if neither parent entered a valid social, and then if non-married parents um, or both married parents entered all zeros for your social, it also will not give you that. The first time that you complete the FAFSA, you have to create what's called an FSA ID. This is how you're going to electronically sign that FAFSA and then also how you're going to get access to the U.S. Department of Ed website. Um, each student has to create one and then one parent, so not both parents need to have it. Um, but you're going to use this throughout the whole financial aid process and then you're going to use the same FSA ID every year you're doing that FAFSA. So you want to make sure you write down that information and that you store it somewhere because it's not going to let you create a new one the next year. 
if you can't remember your information. Um, each social security number is tied to it and you can't ever create another one. Um, you can create that FSA ID either when you're doing the FAFSA or ahead of time. Um, that link is right there with the FSA ID .ed .gov. Um, One tip that we like to say when you're going through it, it gives you the option to verify your email address and to verify your cell phone. Um, it only takes a couple minutes extra, but it's super important to do this because if you forget your username or you forget your password, when you go to do this again next year and you didn't verify those, you're going to have to rely on answering your challenge questions, which can sometimes be a little bit difficult. Um, and it's, it's really hard to reset this information. So you want to take those extra few minutes to validate that stuff so you can just get an email to reset your password or text you a code in case you do forget it next year. There's also a FAFSA on the web worksheet that you can print off if you want to, to get an idea about what questions are going to be asked. Um, kind of get your ducks in a row before actually doing the FAFSA. You do have the option to print that and kind of work through it first. So the general student information that's going to be asked on the FAFSA includes the student social security number. Um, one note with that, if the student's trying to do this on their own for the first time, please make sure that you know for sure what your social is. Um, that's one of the, the biggest mistakes that we tend to see, and it's not the easiest thing to correct. Um, so make sure, you know, if you're you're doing it yourself or when you go to complete it for the first time that you're positive on what that social is. Um, it will also ask the citizenship status, um, the student's marital status. There's a question about drug conviction of possession or sale. If the student is a male, whether or not they've registered for the selective service. And then it asks about the highest education level completed by father and mother. There's also going to be a set of student dependency status questions. So the FAFSA is going to ask these to determine whether or not the student has to put parental information on there. Um, these are going to be different. Um, the Title IV federal student aid is going to be different than IRS purposes. So it, it doesn't include whether or not anybody claimed you for your taxes or things like that. Um, these are separate dependency status questions for what the Department of Ed uses. Um, if all of those responses are no, the student is considered dependent and has to put mom and or dad on there. Um, if they're able to answer yes to any of those questions, then the student is considered independent and doesn't need parent information on information about parents of dependent students will include taxes, um, income, other financial information, your dislocated worker status. Um, it's going to ask um, about means tested federal benefits that you may have received in the previous two years. It's going to ask about assets and then also untaxed income. The same information then is going to be asked about the student and if the student is married about their spouse. Additional information is going to include your college information, information, so where you're planning to go to school. Um, you can include up to 10 different colleges on the application. So if you're not sure where you're going to be going yet, we suggest to put every school on there that you're considering. So that way that school can have FAFSA information. Um, and then you're not having to go back and make updates and add school codes and things like that if you end up changing your mind. It does also ask about housing plans. So whether you're planning to live on campus, off campus, or with a parent, um, this is going to factor in with that cost of attendance amount. So it's it's important to kind of have an idea about what your plans would be for each school. And then it's also going to ask about FAFSA prepare information. This would be if you're like paying someone to help you complete that FAFSA. Um, again, you can get help for free from your financial aid office. So we would suggest against going that route. It does also then require electronic signatures um, from the student and then one parent, so whatever parent is creating that FSA ID. The preferred is to do that electronic option right in that FAFSA, but if you're not able to for any reason, there is also the option to print a signature page and mail it in. 
Um, and then if you're doing that paper FAFSA, you would sign that one right on there. So these are a few of the frequent FAFSA errors that we see. Um, as I mentioned, the social security numbers is a big one. Um, either the student thinks they know what their social is and they have it incorrect, or they're trying to, to put mom and dads on there and they don't have that correct. Um, so that's one that we definitely see a lot. Um, the parent marital status is, then is one that gets mistaken. Um, the wording can be a little bit tricky on the FAFSA, but you're you're going off of your whatever the current situation is. So if mom is the parent that you're using on the FAFSA and mom is now remarried to stepdad, mom's marital status is going to be that married slash remarried and we're using mom and stepdad's information. Um, if you're using your dad's info and he's divorced, hasn't remarried, you're just going to be using dad's info. Um, it can be a little bit tricky with step parents and things like that, but you would be be including mom and stepdad um, for that situation. Um, the income earned by a parent or step parent, that's one portion that doesn't transfer in from the IRS because it it's it doesn't have a way to break it down on your 1040. So you want to make sure that you do have W 2s handy because you will have to put income earned by each parent on there. Um, so you're going to have to know what that breakdown looks like. Um, untaxed income then can sometimes get tricky. There's different questions on the FAFSA, so make sure that you're reading those questions in full so you're including things that should be on there. Um, income taxes paid, then we see that get entered incorrectly sometimes. So again, make sure you're reading those questions um, and following what lines it says to use. Um, the household size then, again, it's it's going to be based on whatever parents you're including on the FAFSA and then any dependents that your parents are also supporting. Um, if you have questions about your household size, reach out to your financial aid office and we can help you figure out who you should be including. Um, same goes with how many students are in college. Um, and then there's a question about real estate and investment net worth. Um, in that investment, don't ever include like your 401k, if you have IRAs, anything retirement wise, we don't want to see on there. Um, and again, if you're completing it with FAFSA on the web, it's going to, to give you a nice little pop up about what types of investments, what types of real estate, things like that, that you want to be including. Um, like don't include the home you live in, things like that. So make sure you're paying attention to those questions so you're not including things that you shouldn't be in that network. So the way that the processing happens then, um, when you complete that FAFSA and get it submitted, there's a copy that gets sent to the college and then there's also a copy that gets sent to the student. So there's an email notification then of the SAR processing. That SAR is the student aid report. Um, as long as you have a valid email address provided on the FAFSA, you're going to get this email to you. Um, you can also get access to it at that studentaid.gov. Um, you want to make sure that you look at this because if there's any errors that are preventing your FAFSA from processing, you're going to see it in the comments section here. Um, there are certain things that get entered on the FAFSA that may hold it up and reject it. Um, and your school may not ever see it then because of that, depending on how they process things. So you want to make sure you're paying attention to this. So you know if there's any issues and then you're you're not just kind of sitting there waiting for something to happen and your school never contacts you because they never received it. Um, so definitely pay attention to this when you receive it. Depending on how you fill that out, then if you don't have a valid email address um, entered on there, they could also be sending the SAR paper um, or the SAR acknowledgement then to if you don't provide that email address. So the easiest way to do it is going to be putting that on there if you're able to. The school then gets what's called an ICER. So that's the Institutional Student Information Record. So that's the one that gets sent to us. Um, so any school that you list on that FAFSA is going to receive this. Um, and at that point, we're going to know if there's any additional documentation that we need from you. Um, each school is going to process these in a different amount of time, though, so you may fill this out and then not hear from your school for a little while. 
um, which is normal depending on when you do it. But again, if you have questions, just reach out, make sure they received it, um, and see when they'll be contacting you about any additional documentation that you may need. You are able to make corrections to the FAFSA data. Um, if you do the FAFSA on the web, um, you can log back into that application and make corrections to it if needed. Um, you could update that paper SAR, or you could also submit documentation to your financial aid office. Um, again, like I mentioned, if you're selected for things like verification, we're going to need to verify things like that household size, the number of people in college, your tax information. So depending on, on what that looks like, we may make corrections to your FAFSA on our side of it then. Some students or parents may have conditions that can't be documented within the FAFSA. So these would include situations like, you know, if you're using taxes from two years prior to where we are right now, maybe you had a job change, maybe you were laid off, um, things like that. If, if that's what the situation is, reach out to your college's financial aid office and explain what happened and they'll let you know if you're eligible to do one of these special circumstances um the decisions on them are final it's it's done at a college level so you can't appeal them to the department of ed um, but just reach out to your financial aid office and explain what your situation is um, if you're eligible for one there's going to be additional documentation and information that we're going to need um, but in certain cases, it, it does allow us to make updates to that FAFSA to better reflect what your current situation is right now. Um, this just covers a few, you know, different scenarios that we see that we've that we do special circumstances for. So if there's a parent or a spouse that has passed away, um, some colleges will do them for medical and dental expenses that were, you know, very unusual during the one year. Um, if there was a loss of employment, very expensive dependent care um, for divorces, um, secondary school tuition, some colleges may do this again. Each college is going to be different with what they offer special circumstances for. Um, and then also if the student is required to provide parental information on the FAFSA but can't for an extreme situation, um, that's also something that you could reach out and talk to your financial aid office about to see what options you have. So that's the end of the presentation. Um, again, if you have questions regarding any of this information, you can reach out to your high school counselor um, or definitely the Office of Financial Aid at whatever school you're considering going to. Thank you.